Good afternoon. On the part of the art and design program at the University of California at Berkeley and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, welcome to this lecture series on migration, the arts, and transformation. My name is Alex Zaragoza, and I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the inspired leadership of Vice Chancellor Shannon Jackson uh, and the generous donors that have made this public series possible. Let me take this opportunity now to introduce our guest speaker for today. Not sure how it happened, but we have someone who was uh, the daughter of Mexican immigrants, grew up at a border town known as Nogales, Arizona. And since then, she's been on an ascent of success that is quite startling. Uh, from Nogales, Arizona, she ended up as an undergraduate and graduated from Harvard University. Uh, subsequently, um, mainly because of uh, her adventuresome uh, personality, she ended up at a university here in the West Coast, uh, well known to those of us here at Berkeley for a lot of different reasons, Stanford University Law School. Uh, she subsequently graduated from Stanford uh, and went on to a career uh, of uh, leading various organizations here in the Bay Area and elsewhere. Uh, and then finally, uh, and I'll let her tell that part of the story subsequently, uh, ended up being a cultural consultant for the Walt Disney Company and Pixar specifically. Uh, in that respect, uh, during our conversation, we'll talk about uh, that journey in much greater detail. Join me in welcoming Marcela Avilas, Davison Avilas. Marcella. Hi, everybody. Can you can you hear me? Okay. Good. Well, I wanted to thank. Uh, Thank Alex and and all of you uh, for inviting me here. Especially wanted to thank um, UC Berkeley and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive for uh, for the welcome and the opportunity to participate in this series uh, on creativity, uh, migration, and, and transformation. Um, quick, couple quick questions. How many folks here are students? Okay. And how many just general public members of the museum? Also terrific. Oh, that's great. How many saw the film? Great. Well, hopefully uh, you'll be inspired to, uh, to view it again on a, a streaming platform. But I'm here to take uh, all of you on a, a little bit of a, of a journey. I'm going to find my little gizmo here, make sure it's working OK, um, to tell you a story of how this uh, story uh, came about and um, my good fortune to, to be involved as a cultural consultant. And I also wanted to just share with everyone that I, some folks sometimes uh, feel or ask me if, uh, if I was involved as a filmmaker and I really wanna make clear that I was not a filmmaker on this project. The filmmakers at Pixar uh, Lee Unkrich, the director, Adrian Molina, the co-director, uh, assistant director, uh, Darla Anderson, and everybody at the studio, um, their role was uh, the filmmaking role, and my role was, um, I guess, to be a part of that whole project. I worked on the film with them for six years to be kind of a culture whisperer and to help them understand uh, my culture, uh, Mexican culture, and to work together as a team to hopefully create a story um, that, uh, as some members of the press call uh, say, uh, to help all of us get it right. So I'm here to share some insights and uh, some of the teachable moments that I gained from working uh, uh, on this Academy Award winning feature. Uh, and I want to note at the outset that um, as part of the journey in working with my colleagues there at the studio, uh, I think that what happened there is that 
together, we sort of invented a new way of storytelling within the Hollywood uh, community. And um, I think it's an important milestone for those of us who are what I might call cultural instigators, as well as folks in the industry. And as I said, that in and of itself is the story that I'm going to try to share today. And I'm offering these remarks uh, within a complicated cultural context, current context, within our civic culture, which is challenged both from within and externally by a fear of what I think all of us once took for granted, an open and welcoming society. But if many today are remembering Franklin Roosevelt's admonition that all we have to fear is fear itself, I also remember uh, the words of another great storyteller from uh, Latin America, Violeta Parra, who was the inventor of the Nuevo Cancion. And she wrote a song called Gracias a la Vida. And some of the lyrics go like this. I'm, don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto. Thank you for life, which has given me so much. Me ha dado el sonido y el abecedario. It's given me sound and the alphabet. Con él las palabras que pienso y declaro. With them, the words I think and declare. Madre, amigo, hermano, y luz alumbrando. Mother, friend, brother, and light shining on la ruta del alma de que estoy amando, the, the sound, the soul's road of the one I love. And I am sharing this with you because I think there's a direct connection from Violeta Parra's epic song story to the story that Lee Unkrich and Adrian Molina created together, their epic journey story about a boy musician who seeks fame and finds something much better, his identity and his family. The songs of the Nuevo Cancion and Pixar's Coco tell an old lesson that I think is evergreen. There's power in storytelling and there's impact in storytelling. <coughs> There's more impact, even I think, than what might result from legislation or from policy. And the other uh, teachable moment that I learned working on this film for six years is that even one person can wield the power to tell a story and to change the way a large corporation does business or a nation does business and can also impact the way communities see each other. What I learned working on COCO was what happens when you stop asking where to find common ground and you start behaving like it already exists. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself and before I share what behaving like it exists means, I wanna share with you how we, we got to this nirvana in the first place. Let's see. How we got from here to here. To here. That's just under a million dollars, a billion dollars, excuse me, of box office. And interestingly enough, if I'm not mistaken, the film did uh, better in terms of earnings in China than it did in the United States. And some of you might have read the numerous articles uh, written about the film, many, many from Mexico, from Latin America, from Spain, written here in the United States, trying to describe how we quote unquote got it right with this movie. 
Well, one way we got it right was through advocacy, through the community's advocacy. And when I, when I talk about community, the way I think about community is I try to be as inclusive as I possibly can when I'm thinking about the Latinx community. And so uh, when I refer to it in my head, I th I'm thinking Latinx, Latino, Latina, Hispano, indigenous, immigrant, migrant. Uh, I try to be as inclusive as I possibly can. And so when I say the word community, that's what I'm thinking about in my head. So the community uh, got it right or helped our colleagues at, at the studio to get it right through its advocacy of what we know about ourselves and what we know about our interaction with media, with the entertainment community, and as consumers. Um, we did our homework and we learned our data like that. U.S. Latinos, 1.7 trillion in buying power. And the gross domestic product of U.S. Latino spending is 2.313 trillion. So it's having that kind of knowledge on the one hand, but it's also having a, a more intangible kind of knowledge, a sort of a memory. And that is a memory, for example, of remembering that this place used to be this place. And that place used to be this place. That's the Mapa de Quantinchan, a Mesoamerican illuminated manuscript map journey story that tells the journey of Mesoamerican indigenous peoples. And many in our community feel that that is still our story. That's our story now. It didn't go away with the conquest. It resides not only in our head, but it resides here in our heart. So how did we get it right? It was a combination of things. It was the, the so-called roar of, of our advocacy in social media. It was the work of cultural translators. And it was a combination of empathy and creativity by the veteran storytellers at the studio that all came together. Now, back in 2013, the news of Pixar's development of an animated feature that would be set during the Mexican holiday known as Day of the Dead was making the rounds of industry blogs and publications and also Latino entertainment industry and cultural networks. Everyone was pretty excited about it. But then news broke that Disney had filed a trademark application for the phrase Day of the Dead. And there was uh, an ensuing controversy and that soon grew into a national uproar. And that not only created international headlines, but it also became a case study for how rebuilding trust and rethinking ideas about storytelling and collaboration might be catalyzed. And here we can stop, I think, and recall the words of someone who's written extensively about Dia de Muertos, but he's also written extensively about language. His name's Octavio Paz. And in his Nobel Prize lecture, he wrote that languages are vast realities that transcend those political and historical entities we call nations. And in this instance, language really did transcend lots of uh, walls that inadvertently had been built up. How did it happen? Well, the outcry on social media about the trademark application catalyzed one at a time. There's some journalists here in the audience. One journalist at a time wrote a story, and some posted their stories 
through their platforms, their newspaper or media platforms, and some posted them as blogs, and some posted them just as Facebook posts, but it's one post at a time. And there were several sharp-eyed journalists and cultural advocates from the community, Fronteras, Latino Rebels, Pocho.com, who wrote about this. A petition was started, it went viral, a satirical cartoon was created, what I, which I showed you earlier. That really went viral. I think there's a tattoo of it now that you can get, of Muerto Mouse. And in one week, uh, the language of that advocacy resulted in the withdrawal of the trademark application. And right after that, the film's producer reached out to me, and we began a journey. And in my view, that journey um, was also a different and another story about impact storytelling. Um, let me give you a little bit of example of what that impact was, because there's a lot of examples, but I'm going to focus on just a few. One impact was that when we came together to, um, to bring the community together with the storytellers to create a feeling of safety and trust, I think what we did was we created an equitable space. We, we worked together to help each other understand the feelings in the community that were caused by the filing, the trademark filing, and to create a way for the community's voice to be heard, to be respected, and to be listened to, and also to be understood as the development process of the making of the film continued. The other thing that we did as a team was we all agreed that we were going to embrace diversity. We wanted to help ensure that the diverse voices that comprise Mexico's culture would be heard, understood, and included in the creative process. And then finally, we wanted to figure out a way to sustain that inclusion. We wanted to help create an environment for the Coco storytelling process so that diverse voices outside of the studio could be included and heard and respected and understood. Well, so how, how do you do all of that? You know, specifically, what were, the, what were the tactics, so to speak? Well, one of the first things I tried to do as a cultural consultant was to try to to create a way to explain how our community feels about our culture, about storytelling, about folklore, about where we came from, about our history. And so um, I went back and I looked up some, some descriptions of Mexico from way back. And here's one of those one of those descriptions. And I, I'm really nearsighted, so I might be going like this a little bit. But here's this description. And when we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land, and when we saw that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, Tenochtitlan, we were astounded. These great towns and temples and buildings rising from the water, all made of stone, it seemed like an enchanted vision from the tale of Amadis. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. It's not surprising, therefore, that I should write in this vein. It was all so wonderful, I say that with a sense of irony here, that I do not know how to describe the first glimpse of things never heard of or seen or dreamed of before. But today, all that I saw then is overthrown and destroyed, and nothing is left standing. And that was written by one of the Spanish soldiers from the conquest. How do the Mexicans remember Tenochtitlan? That's how they remember it. That's Diego Rivera's famous mural of Tenochtitlan. And so what I wanted to do when, in, in sharing this story with my colleagues is I wanted to help everyone remember that remembering is not necessarily only about people, 
Remembering is about places and where you've been and what you've lost. And you can feel mournful and still feel such a sense of sadness over what was lost and what was destroyed in addition to feeling the same way about people. And so that's part of culture, and that's how culture becomes part of identity. So we started this conversation together. And at that point, I think, because we were all coming together, we were wanting to start, intentionally wanting to start from a place that I'll call grace. By that, I mean a place where folks were, where there was empathy, there was curiosity, there was an attitude of being open to new ideas. We reviewed other attempts by filmmakers to present heritage stories. We created guardrails with regard to the storytelling. For example, 100% Latino Mexican cast. No dumbing of the Spanish in Spanish Spanish and, you know, the way you might hear it in Spain. It's Mexican and Latin American Spanish. We shared information about the experience of diverse communities across cultures, about spiritual beliefs, ethnicity, economic background in Mexico and the US. We shared stories about how folks in Mexico might feel about Mexican Americans in the US, how Mexican Americans in the US might feel about folks in Mexico, and lots of different stories in between. We reviewed the everyday emblems of life. Language, music, tapestry arts, food, shoes, hats, toys, pets, jokes, anything that we could think of that are sort of the emblems and the elements of culture. And then from, from here, the creative team, in my view, fashioned began to put together a story from both a creative perspective and sort of um, a learning or a pragmatic perspective. And this is how they did it. They, they combined everyone's cultural knowledge. They identified cultural beliefs with us which are similar or shared. We illuminated cultural and curatorial practices to express common beliefs. We shared our stories about how people experience culture and why that experience translates to feelings of identity in order to not only reveal sort of a creative common ground, but to celebrate it. So one of the ways that we got it right was because we intentionally set out to remember history. And one of the ways we got it right was because we intentionally set out to remember the stories of our ancestors and our elders. And we also got it right because we engaged in what I call memory making. We made memories both by sharing stories, but also by engaging in the activities that comprise the Day of the Dead tradition. We got it right because we combined technology with the arts and humanities. And I've got a additional observation with respect to tech and arts and humanities. What I learned working on Coco was that one person really can make a difference. I mean, I saw time and time again when we brought in elders, we brought in folks from the community uh, to speak and share their stories. Oftentimes there would be a story from one person in those group settings that would spark an idea. Um, if you've seen the movie, you might be familiar with the famous chancla scene where the Abuelita gets a little upset at her grandson and she whips out her slipper, otherwise known as a chancla, and she, she thwaps it. That, that came out of our group sessions. Another, there were many other examples of that. Um, and so, in addition to those contributions, what, it, what that made me realize is that technology without a heart 
and without integrity is not innovative. But if you have a story that doesn't have an audience, then it's hard for it to make impact. And there are many different kinds of audiences. There's the ticket buying audience, for example. But there's also the audience of one, your teacher, your parent, your boss, your coworker, your roommate. You can be your own audience. And one of the things that we did in this process was to recognize that those individual contributions can really um, help folks to rethink uh, storytelling that is, you know, already going down a, a certain road. Um, I found that my role as a culture whisperer, that I could be successful, or perhaps the most successful, when I tried to step into the shoes of my colleagues at the studio and my colleagues from the community, one person at a time, and to see things from that person's point of view and to share a bit about my own personal journey. So I'll give you an example. This is a photo of my grandfather and my uncle. About midway through the making of the film, I was asked to give a lecture on, on uh, Dia de Muertos at Pixar for the whole studio. And I was really excited about the opportunity because it meant that I could share more about the culture and about the holiday to a broader audience there. And before I started, I introduced myself and I shared a few bits about my family, where my parents were from, Guadalajara and Sonora, and that my grandfather was both a charro and an accountant. And somehow he didn't go crazy from living that dichotomy, the cowboy accountant. And I also had a great uncle who was a semi-famous poet from Sonora, and his name was Alonso Aviles, but he had a pen name which was Moisen Francisco de Avila. And not only that, he was a surrealist poet, which meant that nobody could understand him in English or Spanish. And um, I got a laugh out of that line, as I had intended. I had created a translation of culture, my culture, my family culture, my Mexican culture, but as I was doing that, nobody felt that I was speaking in a foreign language. They were identifying with the story that I was telling about myself. And I gave my colleagues a piece of myself, and then they gave me a piece of themselves. They gave me their stories back. And some of those stories were really overpowering. Some were very poignant. Some were sometimes difficult to hear about struggling and challenging times. But that process helped us to all come together and identify the universal message that I believe Coco imparts, which is we all have family. And there's always a time in your life when you think if you could only have one moment back with someone that you loved and lost, what would that be? What would that be like? And that universal feeling is what we all came together on. And so I encourage all of you guys to do the same, to be generous that way and courageous in that way. You'll be surprised how it can work, even in the smallest of spaces, like an elevator. And remember that you, by yourself, really can make a difference. I, I've seen it happen not just on this film, I've seen it happen in other instances, and I think we're seeing it play out in other ways in our civic culture today. Remember where you came from, remember your elders, spend time with them now. Don't, don't be regretting it 15 years from now, because they've got some amazing badass stories to share, I know, and I think the experience of that transmission of storytelling and knowledge is so important. So 
I'm going to end by just encouraging you to remember to both share your story and to ask for and receive stories, even stories you may find difficult to hear, because that's a way of giving love. And the love that you give can be equal to the love that you make, to paraphrase the Beatles. And I really think you'll find that it's more than an even trade. Thanks very much. We're going to go into a uh, question and answer session. But before we do that, I thought we might talk a little bit about how a little girl that grows up at the border in Nogales ends up first at Harvard and then Stanford Law, becomes the director of a big foundation here in, in the Bay Area. And then, wow, all of a sudden is called on the phone by the Walt Disney Company. We need help. That's a big trajectory there for us. So could you tell me a little bit about that, that trajectory? What were key turning points? Uh, some teacher, some uncle, some parent, or it all came from <laughs> the heavens, so to speak? Well, I, I think um, that, yeah, I think you're right. I think it came from a combination of, uh, of things of, um, you know, uh, I was the proverbial geek in high school, you know. I've been wearing these glasses for a long time. <laughs> um, and so I had, um, I was a geek in high school and in, in school in general because I, I wanted to see what it would be like to be outside of Tucson, outside of Nogales, outside of Arizona, and have a have a career, and that that um, ambition, I guess, if you want to call it, was uh, instilled in me by my parents. So I would start with my parents because they very much wanted me to uh, have an education and um, see the world and um, have an have an adventure. I, I think it was an interesting. Um, yin and yang. I mean, my mom really wanted me to go out and see the world. My dad was a little bit more conservative, and I think his ambition for me was uh, simpler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, so, you know, my parents read to me quite a bit, and I would have to say, and my mom and I used to watch movies together. So it was probably a combination of reading, 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 and just being a nerd and just wanting to read all the time and, and seeing what the world was like through books. And then my mom was very into music, and so music education was very big. So I was not only the nerdy geek, but I was the nerdy geek with the little violin case who would you know, <laughs> trudge along in school. And, and, uh, but learning how to play the violin and, um, and playing in an orchestra and then playing in a youth symphony, that allowed me to go places because the youth symphony would go play outside of Tucson and that was an influence that was very impactful and that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the power and the impact of music education because um, once a kid gets into a band or an orchestra or a choir, I mean, there's nothing stopping them, I think, because you learn so much uh, being in a, in a bigger group, and you learn a lot uh, learning the, uh, the technique of music, and that can help you in, in lots of other ways. I think the other influence was um, uh, that I happened to be growing up at a time when ideas about providing access for marginalized communities, um, diverse communities, was that was brand new. It had just gotten started, and it had a, a label at the time, and the label was affirmative action. And it wasn't um, wasn't creating a, a, a political um, debate the way it has today. And uh, so, 
there were, uh, I think, efforts on the part of um, my high school teachers as well as uh, recruiters at various colleges to try to get students from diverse communities in, into colleges, you know, Ivy League colleges or colleges in California, what have you. So I was just at the very beginning. I graduated from high school in 1976. So I was at the very beginning of that. And then finally, I think um, in terms of, you know, post, uh, you know, there are many funny stories I don't want to bore people with in terms of, you know, how did I actually get into Harvard or what led me to Stanford. But I think that I was always very drawn to this notion of storytelling and the impact that you can make um, through film, especially. And uh, so I guess the, the last sort of major influence um, that really kind of propelled me into wanting to figure out a way to, to create um, a career for myself in the business is um, I, uh, I, w I volunteered for um, a congressman named Morris Udall, who was my congressman from Tucson at the time. And um, when I was doing that in Washington, D.C., uh, it was an unpaid internship. I needed to figure out a way to survive for the summer, and so I sold tickets at an at a arts uh, film theater. And as luck would have it, the movies that they were showing that summer were uh, some of the greatest movies in American film history. And so I went to school during that summer um, courtesy of the Biograph Theater, and that really, that's when I became acquainted with Frank Capra and Howard Hawks and John Ford and Preston Sturgis, and um, that really pushed me into uh, trying to figure out a way to, to create a, a similar journey for myself. Yeah. Well, given the significance of your parents um, in terms of your formation and so on, could you tell us a little bit about your parents' background? Well, gladly. Um, <laughs> my mom, Nona uh, Aviles um, de Davison, to use the old-fashioned term that women used to describe themselves when they were married. Um, she's from Guadalajara. Uh, she was born there. Um, her, uh, her father was from uh, Santander, Spain, and her mother was, was Mexican. And um, actually, I take that back. That was my great grandmother. My mother's father was was uh, the guy that uh, that you saw up there, Jesus Aviles, who was from Guaymas. She was born in Guadalajara, and my grandmother Consuelo Aviles was born in Nogales before Arizona was a state. So mm -hmm. I like to say she's from Sonora because <laughs> it's you know she was neither from neither there nor nor here. She was she was from Sonora. And she grew up in Guadalajara, and she um, uh, moved from Guadalajara to Nogales with my grandmother in 1944. And at the time, she didn't know English, so the way for her that she ended up learning English, and you couldn't, you were not allowed to speak English, in, or excuse me, Spanish in school. So they made her sit with the first graders in, in, until she learned how to speak English fluently and without an accent. And, uh, and then once that was accomplished, she was able to attend class with kids her age. And she ended up becoming a, a teacher of English and Spanish <laughs> uh, later on. My father, Robert Davison, was born in a little town in Sonora called Carbo. And his background is really interesting. His father, R William Davison, was from New Jersey. And he couldn't see out of one eye. And so he, the family legend has it that uh, he was having a hard time finding work. And so he immigrated down to Mexico to find work when he found work with the railroad. And he became a mining mechanic with, uh, I believe, the whatever outpost Southern Pacific had down there. And he also traveled into South America, into Peru and, and Chile. But he ended up settling down in Sonora, this six-foot-tall gringo with 
very fair skin and green eyes. He fell in love with the country, he fell in love with my grandmother, and he had nine children. Wow. <clears throat> and uh, in, in uh, Carbo. And in uh, 1925, he brought the, the whole family to Nogales. And uh, uh, I think that he and my grandmother felt it would be better for them uh, to, there were other family members up there, and so they, they immigrated up there. But I think it's, I find it amusing that my grandfather couldn't find work in the United States, and so where did he go? He went down to Mexico to get a job. <laughs> and found a wife. Yeah, found a wife. <laughs> so my, my folks are from Mexico. I also have, uh, rel you know, direct relatives from Spain. And, uh, but most of my direct relatives are um, in Mexico, either <clears throat> Nogales, Sonora, or Ciudad Obregón, or Guaymas have many, many family members in Wyamas, Mexico City, mm -hmm. uh, other places. Um, if you allow me, maybe we can jump to getting to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I was wondering about the adjustments, if any, that you had to, um, in a sense, deal with, or was it a smooth transition from Arizona to Cambridge, Massachusetts in that respect? Uh, it was a little bit of both. I mean, I was, you know, I wanted to get out of Dodge. You know, I just <laughs> wanted to get out of Tucson and go, you know, experience someplace else. So the fact that I um, was accepted to to Harvard was uh, was tremendous. Although when it happened, I literally did not know what Harvard was. I mean, I just knew that it was a college in Massachusetts, and that was good enough for me. <laughs> and uh, um, and to just give you a little sense of the, of the sort of the, there was a culture clash that was felt in my family, um, I almost uh, didn't go. And the reason I almost didn't go, I think I shared this story with you, is that um, my father was very, very conservative um, <clears throat> politically. And so was my uncle. And you know, in a traditional Mexican household, what, what the man says is supposed to be what goes, but actually in reality it's, you know, my mother and my grandmother were sort of running the show, <laughs> except my dad just didn't happen to know it. Um, and uh, <laughs> so my uncle comes over and he says to my dad, you know, Bob, you cannot let Marcella go to Harvard. And, and my dad uh, did not graduate from college. He attended college, but he didn't, he didn't graduate. And my uncle had graduated from the University of Arizona, so everyone was very, you know, Theo Enrique, you know, if he came over and he opined on anything, you know, he was a college graduate, you had to listen to what he was saying. So in this instance, he was saying, she cannot go to Harvard, and my dad says, well, you know, Enrique, why not? And, and Henry says, you know, uh, she's going to turn into a communist if she goes to Harvard. <laughs> you know, she's just, she, they're Bolsheviks over there, and you cannot let her go. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, the wheels are cranking. i got to do something here. Now, my father was very well read, and one of the uh, journalists that he used to read quite a lot was William F. Buckley. <laughs> and I knew that Buckley had gone to the Ivy League, but I, I, I didn't know which school, so I just punted. I said, Dad, you know, William F. Buckley, do you know where William F. Buckley went to school? <laughs> and he goes, no, mija, his eyes get, I mean, I swear to God, his eyes get really big. He goes, no. And he said, he went to Harvard. <laughs> and he said, I, there's a beat. You know, if I was writing the screenplay, you know, a beat, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> and then dad says, okay, you can go. <laughs> and now, you know, the joke is that he went to Yale, not Harvard. <laughs> but, um, you know, and then I went, and then I had a great time. And, I, you know, I almost flunked out my freshman year, because, you know, who knows what they're doing their freshman year. And you have the proverbial call to your mother, you know, crying on the phone and that you want to come home. That There were phones back then. There weren't cell phones. Uh, and she, then my mother just kind of kicked me in the nalgas mm -hmm. and said, no, you're not coming home. You know, you can do it. She gave me a lot of encouragement. And, you know, so I sniffed a little bit and I hung up. And uh, I, had to, I had to figure out how to, um, how to learn in that environment in, mm -hmm. di in a different way. Yeah. I just did, I asked a lot of questions. Okay. Um, okay, let's do another jump. Okay. So um, you're sitting in your office, you get a phone call, and the, somebody says, if I can paraphrase it, we need your help. Um, 
could you tell us something more specifically about that creative process that resulted in this film? Um, you summarized a lot for us uh, in that respect, but um, I, I remember when we had uh, our first conversation and this sort of thing, you were so eloquent about all these little stories, in a sense, that went into Adrian Molina starting at this point in the creative process and then eventually becomes the assistant director mm -hmm. uh, and so on, in part because of all of, all of those issues that you mentioned in your talk here uh, today for us. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that creative process, uh, working with the producer, the director, cinematographers, uh, the story people, and, and, and so on. That, that creative uh, aspect that went into that conversation that ended up on the screen this way? Well, I, I uh, it was a very, very interesting journey. I, I think that what I tried to do best was to help the storytellers better understand a very rich and complicated ta tapestry of emo community emotions of um, heritage in, in history. And so um, it was, you know, there were a lot of moving parts and I think the first thing that, that I wanted to try to do was to, um, create a relationship between myself and the filmmakers where they, they could feel um, that they could trust me and I could feel that, they, that I could trust them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, part of what I did was, for example, I, I, I shared information about my family, but I, I did a lot of... Um, translating. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why, you know, for example, after the trademark application situation, what I tried to do was to, if it wasn't myself, to bring other folks to the studio to help people understand why people felt the way they felt. And it's not like po folks didn't know that. Yes, every, you know, everyone at the studio every um, understood. I think the, the additional leap was this notion of culture as identity. Mm -hmm. That I think it's, you know, a lot of folks sort of talk that talk, but it, it takes a lot of work, excuse me, to really understand what does that mean? That culture is identity. And that notions of today, uh, cultural appropriation uh, sometimes I'll read articles about, well, why are people getting so upset, you know, about cultural appropriation? And it's because when it's you're appropriating something about me, you're appropriating my identity when you do that. Uh, and, and that's how people feel, and that's kind of how I felt. And, um, and it, you know, where does that come from? Well, Here's the country today, but you know what? This is what it used to look like back here. And people don't forget. You know, I'm from Sonora. People, I'm from the border. I don't forget that there used to not be a border there and that my family could walk back and forth and not be asked where I came from. I have my passport in my purse. I have my passport in my purse because today I'm afraid that someone's going to question who I am. And so I feel like I have to have my passport in my purse. So that's memory. That's what cultural identity is about. And so we, we really kind of got into those challenging conversations within the context of storytelling and understanding why folks can get upset. And f actually, we had some instances in which folks got really upset uh, and expressed their point of view. And so um, I think it was but you can't have those conversations unless people buy in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do want to say is that um, f 
from day one, from the first second that I got that phone call from my colleagues at Pixar, um, what was communicated to me was, we want to get it right. Um, we, uh, we want the community to come in. We want to listen to them. We will listen to them. I mean, I remember we had a conversation with Lalo Alcaraz, mm -hmm. and uh, he, uh, one of the questions that he asked was, you know, if I give you notes, will you take my notes? Will you listen to my notes? Or is this a situation where we're just going to validate something that's already been locked? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, no, we're going to take your notes. He said, okay, I'm in. And Lalo got a lot of heat for that. You know, he started getting his own hate mail because he decided to work. Sell out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People started calling him vendido. I mm -hmm. mean, so, yeah. That's a little bit of, of sort of the day-to-day. -day. And, and then there was a lot of um, work having to do with illuminating certain aspects of the culture, whether it was folklore, whether it was music, um, or uh, cuisine. So there was the existential, intangible stuff. And then there was the uh, very tangible, um, this is how you make tamales, you know, <laughs> that right, kind of thing. Right. This is how they would appear on a table. Um, and uh, uh, a combination of those skill sets, I guess. Okay. Um, at the risk of making this a, a personal question, um, because I love, uh, I grew up just listening to traditional Mexican music, Pedro Infante and mariachis and this sort of thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the use of the music and so forth? Um, it didn't sound like the director producer were mariachi <laughs> musicians at any time in their life, sort of thing. No, I, I think I think that uh, well, first of all, um, the team, the music team was the best. You know, Michael Giacchino is uh, his reputation precedes him. He's one of the best. Uh, um, writers of, of film scores in the in the business and that was fantastic that we had it was such a blessing to to have and, and an honor to work with him but in addition uh jermaine uh, franco was brought on and she's uh mexicana uh arranger composer uh producer and so what we did was to um you know do a lot of research Mm -hmm. uh, but because the little boy's character was he wanted to be uh, a, a mariachero, um, that was, you know, and I've spent years producing mariachi festivals, mariachi concerts. I definitely know a little bit about the mariachi community and, and the tradition. Um, I'm not a mariachi musician myself, although my cousin is. Uh, <laughs> but um, so I was able to bring uh, that expertise, but... Uh, the combination of Jermaine and, and Michael, and then many, many uh, consultants, uh, I believe the, um, gosh, I'm blanking. I can't believe I'm blanking. Mexican Institute of Sound, Camilo Lara, mm -hmm. he was also brought on board. And so you, and, and then they went down to Mexico and worked with all sorts of musicians, Son Jarocho, Mariachi, Huasteco, Norteño, um, and they created a soundtrack that was you know, as about authentic as it could possibly be. And uh, so that was, you know, their efforts to create an authentic sound in addition to authentic visuals was, uh, was very successful. But one of the things that we did was to say to them, um, the, the sound signature of the music, you've got, you, you have to nail that. The, the, the sound of Mexican music, it, you know, you can't fake it. It has to be Mexicano. And I, and I and the way you do that is you bring in you know paisanos to to do it and they did. Sounded good to me. <laughs> okay, questions, comments, and this sort of thing. Raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Hi, uh, I'm Mackenzie. I really appreciated your lecture. It was very inspiring. Um, I just wanted to ask, so you emphasize the immense effect that media can have on the public. Um, do you think that social media is more constructive in tearing down stereotypes than building them up? Oh, 
That's a good question. I, you know what, I think, I have to say that in recent times, I think social media has done um, an amazing job unpacking stereotypes and tropes. And it was social media that, um, that created a new paradigm for how, story, how this story got told because the, the, the cultural advocacy that happened was all through social media. And um, I think what's happening now is that you have um, new storytellers, cultural advocates, uh, bloggers, um, keepers of culture, who now have a platform that they didn't have before. And you know, before you could have Walt Disney make a movie about South America and and the storytelling was, was controlled by a bunch of white guys down in Burbank. Um, now, that couldn't happen. I mean, it just cannot happen. Because if it does, if, 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 if the audience or if, if the community feels that their stories are being uh, appropriated or told in a way that's not sensitive or respectful, they're just not going to have it anymore. Now, that's not to say that someone outside of our community, you know, cannot tell our story. That that's, you know, stories should be told by anyone who wants to tell them. But I think what's happening now is that folks are also saying, okay, we're going to respond back, and that ha is has created um, a new power dynamic that didn't exist before. Uh, certainly, within the context of traditional Hollywood, you know, how do you make a film? It didn't exist before. Okay. Another question? Um, hi. So I was wondering, as your job as a cultural consultant, like what sources did you use to make sure like you got it right? Well, I've been doing this a long time. And so when I first started, my mother was one of my major sources. <laughs> uh, I would call her all the time. Um, but uh, so the community, I, I, uh, re I re routinely I, re I reach out to scholars, writers, uh, other academics, um, to uh, cultural activists, um, artists, uh, musicians. I, I, I like to what I, I like to go to the source. So if I'm working on a project that's about a specific type of music, for example, like this one, mariachi, you know, fortunately, I, I'm very familiar with all the many, many, you know, concert level mariachi groups. I went right to them. Um, and so, so I, what I don't do is, is leave it to myself because I know what I don't know. And I definitely don't know a lot. And so I always, uh, and I don't rely on the internet. I mean, <laughs> by itself, right? That, that is just, it gets me there. But I always double check and double check because the last thing that I wanna do is to provide information that's factually incorrect. Because a lot of what I do is, um, is to pro provide information on history or to provide information on heritage. Heritage is different from history or to provide information on culture, which is different from heritage, which is different from history, right? And you have to, you have to go to the source in order to get it right. And so uh, I do a lot of research, typically, on, uh, on various projects that, to get me to that, that uh, group of people who can. And I, in, in, in this instance, we brought uh, many, many, many people to, you know, several dozen to, to the studio. To, to do exactly that. Hi, uh, thanks. Um, especially I'm thinking with the, the visuals for the land of the dead. How, what was the source is going into there? Was there a rich history of artistic representation that you were feeding from or how much was newly created and where did that come from? Well, I think what I would do to answer that is to, um, try to channel my colleagues who are the filmmakers. Because in that instance, I was there to help them 
but they were doing, uh, you know, they were doing the research, and they went to Mexico several times, and uh, they brought in, in addition to myself, several experts from Mexico. We we helped to bring artisans. Uh, uh, there's a there's a saying there's for for someone who's a uh, who curates the ofrenda, who's a uh, ofrendista, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, we brought uh, folks into the studio, but um, I believe there's a, 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 a few documentaries in which the filmmakers that, that you can have access to if they're not on YouTube, they might be um, downloadable via Netflix or something, in which they go, you can go behind the scenes to see how, what the filmmakers did to create that visual for the, for the land of the dead. But I think, um, one thing that I tried to uh, underscore, which they already knew, but I tried to underscore it, was uh, that in the depiction of the land of the dead, that you, you really needed to go way back to the indigenous origins of Dia de Muertos, which I think they did. If you, if you go and look at those visuals, you'll see that things start with uh, Mesoamerican sort of monumental type architecture and reference to indigeneity. And then from there, it builds up and up and up and up until you get to a modern skyscraper at the, at the top of this big, huge tower that's in the land of the dead. And so what, uh, what I observed my colleagues, the, the filmmakers doing was, was so right on, which was just go down there. And in fact, I, I, I'm in one of the documentaries, and that's one of the things they, that, that you know, you'll hear me say is if you want to be authentic, you have to you have to travel to Mexico yeah, in order to do that, and that's what they did. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, in creating Coco, how did you balance the story that you wanted to tell um, based on your personal experiences with satisfying the public and kind of creating a film that could connect to so many people? Well, again, um, th that's a great question. And I just want to make really sure that everyone understands that I am not a filmmaker. I have aspirations to be a filmmaker, and I'm working on <laughs> several projects in case there are folks from the studio in this audience. Nudge, nudge, <laughs> wink, wink. Um, but I will, what I'll, what I, I can share a story that Lee Anchorage, who is the filmmaker, shared with me, which I think answers your question. Um, I remember meeting him early on, and um, and he shared a very personal story with me about what, why he sort of fell in love with this tradition called Dia de Muertos. And it was what I shared earlier, which was he, he became acquainted with the tradition, I think through his travels, and it sparked a question in his head. And the question was, what would it be like if I could be reunited with someone I loved and lost? That was what really sparked him to attempt to tell a story that was set during Dia de Muertos. And when he shared that story with me, you know, me being Mexican, I started bawling. And, and, I, and I said to him, you're more Mexican than I am right now. And so it was his keying on that universal aspect of what Dia de Muertos is about. You know, it's about memory making. It's about keeping someone alive, and it's about um, creating a way th through engaging in your own uh, sort of curatorial activity. You know, making an ofrenda, what, a families coming together intentionally to um, craft a memory. You are literally crafting a memory by building the ofrenda, that's coming together to engage in memory making. And, and when that happens, those universal uh, uh, memories, memories th that everyone can have in common, um, become illuminated. And I think that's, that's what Lee knew, essentially, in his core, that's what he knew. And I think that's the reason that that film is the universal success that it, that it is. Hi.
Hi. Um, thank you also for your eloquent storytelling of this, the backstory. It sounds like your participation and your company's participation in this project was um, as a result really of damage control. It was a reactive outreach to you to, for assistance. And I'm wondering um, if you could share with us other clients and other projects that you work on if that is typically the dynamic or is the dynamic the reverse in which um, clients are more, more proactive in reaching out to you before problems arise, um, you know, with more proactive intentions of getting it right, not making it right after it was wrong, right. if you will. Well, that's a really good question. And if you want a public relations job, you know, come talk to me afterwards. Um, <laughs> No, I, it's a combination. Uh, sometimes folks will contact me because, yeah, they're in damage control mode. And um, although I will say that in most instances, it's through inadvertence. It's, it's because folks don't know what they don't know, and especially if you're in a storytelling business and uh, for whatever reason folks decide to tell a story that they're not, that's ethnic-based or heritage-based or specific to a certain community and they're not from that community. Um, I mean, I find it that it still is happening, which is unusual, I suppose, given where we are these days. But uh, it still happens that, you know, projects get populated the, the way they do. Producers hire other folks that they know and they may not know people from a given community. But there are, other, there are other projects that I'm working on in which that kind of anticipatory, uh, uh, thoughtful um, way of, it, of, of embracing the story is, in fact, uh, I'm, knock on wood, I'm, I'm in contract on a, on a potential project right now where that's the case, where uh, folks have reached out to me very, very early on. Um, so I think it's, and you know, it can, it can happen, those types of questions don't only happen in a Hollywood or theatrical context. They can happen in a corporate context. It can happen in a policy context where uh, folks are, are communicating messages that aren't resonating or are actually <coughs> deemed to be insulting um, because they don't understand who they're talking to from a cultural identity perspective. So I think, th I think these teachable moments can be useful in a corporate context, in a policy context, um, as well as in the traditional once upon a time context. Hello. Hello there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josephine. Um, I was wondering, how has your undergraduate and graduate college education influenced and led you to your current career trajectory? Oh, it definitely influenced me. How so? Uh, um, well, you know, if it had been up to my parents, I would have gotten my college degree from Harvard and come back and gotten married and had kids. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, at Harvard, I... Um, you know, I fell in love with the movies at Harvard. I mean, I was already in love with the movies, but I kind of didn't know, you know, I only, I'd only been to actually Walt Disney's, you know, matinees on the weekends, right? So Harvard gave me an opportunity to really learn about the craft of filmmaking and to understand what, you know, to, to be acquainted with the work of, you know, amazing, uh, directors like uh, the ones that I mentioned. And then st the law school experience, what I learned from law school was how, how to stay out of trouble from a standpoint of doing deals and contracts and things like that. And I guess what law school really uh, ingrained in me is this perspective of what could go wrong. What the heck could go wrong on any given project? That, uh, that is what I'm always asking from the standpoint of being a cultural consultant. Like, if you have this story, what could go wrong? Who could get mad? Who could hate on you, right? Why would that happen? So, so it's an odd journey from law school, but that, that's when you go to, when you're learning to be a lawyer, 
what they're trying to teach you is how to mediate conflict or how to stay out of conflict. Um, and, uh, and so what I picked up from that was this, to always be asking that, and really to kind of have an attitude of, someone's bringing me in so that they can better understand how to tell a story. That is such an amazing thing for that person to do. When you're a storyteller, like when I'm doing my own storytelling, I don't want anyone else to help me tell the story. <laughs> you know, I'm telling my story, you just stay over there, right? But uh, there are times when I'm telling a story like, oh, you know what, I do not know. I don't know the subject matter. I'm in love with the subject matter, but I really need some help here. And so when somebody does that, that is such a gift. And so then I feel it's my job to have their back. I always say to everyone that I'm working with that what I promise to try and do, I don't guarantee it, but what I try to do is to have their back. I am not the storyteller. I'm here to help them. That's the other thing I say is I'm not the storyteller. You know, I don't want your job. Don't worry. I'm not going to try to be the director. Uh, so that's a little bit of what, what I got out of the Harvard Stanford experience. Hello. Oh, yeah. Hi. Okay. My name is Lila, and I was wondering um, is, do you ever struggle between like, creating comedy in these types of movies without just being a United States company inadvertently being racist or appropriating another culture? Like, is there ever a gray area between those two things? Hmm, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, so, I think, well, first of all, thank you for asking it, because I'm now, I'm really causing me to really think about what that means. And I, th I think that today, media companies such as, or, Media companies, big and small, storytellers, individual or in groups, um, exist in a global environment. And the reason why is because of technology. And so I tend to think that because that's the case, um, that we're in an environment in which uh, storytellers from all over the world are engaging in making magic that may not necessarily only be about them, their own culture, about their own heritage. And that, and that this notion of making magic through storytelling is so terrific and so wonderful. Um, but that it requires uh, a, it requires being mindful of a responsibility that we have to um, authenticity, to being sensitive to uh, readers and listeners, as well as being mindful of one's own creativity and artistry. So right now there's this debate going on about, is art for art's sake dead? Is, are, you know, are we now in an era where you can only make art for a purpose and that purpose is social justice? And my view is, you know, it has always been thus. <laughs> you know, we've always, artists have always been, you're never going to stop an artist from doing their own thing if you live in a free society. And, um, you know, sometimes art that was where the artist is not sort of, you know, has a message is the story that delivers the message the best way. Um, like a guy like Frank Capra, a lot of people said he was a political filmmaker, but he wasn't. He was a romantic. His stories were about people falling in love that happened to find themselves in fraught situations politically. But, and so he got a message ac across through their love stories, not necessarily because he was trying to, you know, hit you over the head with a message. So I think, yeah, they're gray areas. I think there are. But I think the difference between now and 1939, when so many great movies were made, is that um, folks have 
a more intentional understanding of how they're impacting their audience in a way they didn't have before. Okay, well, I'm sorry that we have to cut off the question and answer. I think um, Marcella, if I can ask, use a first name, uh, might be willing to stay for a minute or two if you want to talk to her individually and so on. Please join me in thanking Marcella Davidson-Avenue. Thank you.